In this video, we're going to look at an overview of the cardiovascular system, how it is structured, its main functions, and then we'll look at some characteristics of cardiac muscle tissue. So the functions of the cardiovascular system can be divided into primarily transportation, regulation, and protection. So the cardiovascular system transports oxygen and carbon dioxide. So oxygen comes in from the lungs and goes into the bloodstream, and we circulate that to our cells and we use oxygen to make ATP, our energy molecule. And then carbon dioxide is a waste product that is removed from cells, goes into the bloodstream, and is released in the lungs. But we also circulate nutrients from the digestive system. Nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine and they go into the bloodstream to the liver through the hepatic portal system. The liver sorts the nutrients, stores some, and releases some into the blood. And then that circulates to the rest of the body so that all of our cells have nutrients for growth and repair. And then other waste products are removed from the cells and go into the blood and they're excreted by the kidneys. The cardiovascular system also transports hormones and we have plasma proteins that carry certain molecules. We transport immune molecules like our antibodies. The cardiovascular system is composed of the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood. So when we look at the blood vessels, they can constrict or dilate. So this can regulate how much blood is flowing to different tissues. So we can regulate our blood pressure by how constricted or dilated our blood vessels are. The other thing, when we constrict or dilate blood vessels, it affects how heat is held in or released from the body. So when we exercise and it's warm, we want to get rid of excess heat. So our surface blood vessels will dilate when we're hot and then extra heat can be released from the body. And when we're cold, then the surface blood vessels are going to constrict to keep heat in the body. Our body temperature, our core body temperature should always be around 37 degrees Celsius. And then our cardiovascular system has protective mechanisms. So the two main things are the immune system. We have immune cells that travel through the lymphatic system as well as the blood vessels. And the immune cells produce antibodies which can bind to pathogens. And then we also have blood clotting. So when our blood vessels are damaged, then we have our fibrinogen protein and we have platelets in the blood that will form clots and it will prevent excessive bleeding. Now, let's look at the general structure of the cardiovascular system and how we move blood through the heart and the blood vessels to the tissues. When we look at anatomical diagrams, the human in the textbook is facing the reader, okay? So this person is looking at the reader. So that means when we're looking at this diagram, this person, this is the right side of the body, and this is the left side of the body. So even though this is the right side of the page, it's the left side of the body. So in this diagram, we are looking at the heart and how it pumps blood to the body. Basically, there are two circuits. We have a systemic circulation and we have a pulmonary circulation. So it's also color coded so that when we see the blue, this means it is oxygen poor or deoxygenated. And when it is red, it is oxygen rich or oxygenated. So when oxygen binds to the hemoglobin in the red blood cells, it causes the blood to look a brighter red. The blood in our veins is not actually blue. So we, it just looks a darker red color compared to blood that's oxygenated. So when the blood is flowing through the heart and through the body, it uses these two circuits. When the blood is coming back to the heart from the body, it is moving towards the right side of the heart. So the upper body, the blood is going to flow through these upper veins to the right side of the heart. We're going to look in more detail at the specific cardiac cycle in the next video. So this I'm just going to go through a general overview. 
and the blood from the lower part of the body also comes up through large veins to the right side of the heart. Then that blood is deoxygenated because the oxygen was used in the cells to make energy. And then carbon dioxide was put into these blood vessels. And now it is carried back to the heart. From the right side of the heart, the blood is then going to flow to the lungs so that it can pick up oxygen and it can get rid of carbon dioxide. So then in the lungs, we have a left and a right pulmonary circuit. In the lungs, gas exchange occurs in the capillary networks. Just like in the capillary networks of the tissues, this is where oxygen is released into the tissues and carbon dioxide is taken up. In the capillary network of the lungs, oxygen is taken up and carbon dioxide is released. Then the oxygenated blood is going to flow back to the heart and it flows back to the left side. Then the oxygenated blood is going to get pumped to the rest of the body. The biggest blood vessel in the body is the aorta. This is the largest artery and that is going to branch off and send blood to the tissues. And then gas exchange occurs again, nutrients are exchanged and the blood flows back to the heart. Now the vessels that are bringing blood to the heart are the veins and the blood vessels that are moving blood from the heart to the body or to the lungs are the arteries. So the arteries move blood away from the heart. So most of the time arteries are carrying oxygenated blood, but there's one exception and that's our pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery is bringing blood away from the heart and to the lungs, but it is deoxygenated blood. Once the blood picks up oxygen in the lungs, it is carried back to the heart through the pulmonary veins, and this is oxygenated. But all the other veins in our body are going to be carrying deoxygenated blood. So we have a systemic circulation and a pulmonary circulation. We need to pick up the oxygen from the lungs, and then we need to bring it back to the heart to pump it to the body. Then the body uses that oxygen, gets rid of waste, and then it gets pumped back to the heart, back to the lungs, to the heart, to the body, heart, lungs. Okay, so there's two circuits. In the blood, red blood cells are carrying the oxygen and the white blood cells are the immune cells and the platelets are responsible for blood clotting. The liquid component of the blood is called plasma and this is where nutrients and ions, um, water and different things are going to be either dissolved or carried by a carrier protein like fatty acids for example or fat soluble hormones. Okay, so in the blood the main components are the cells and the plasma. Now, if we zoom into the heart muscle, let's just look at the cardiac muscle tissue. It has some unique features compared to other muscle tissues that we've looked at in other videos. Cardiac muscle cells are the cardiac myocytes and they contain about one to three nuclei per cell, whereas our skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated. Okay, so the cardiac muscle cells have one to three nuclei and many mitochondria and the mitochondria are large. Mitochondria are the organelles that make ATP. So the heart has to contract for our entire life. Actually, it starts contracting at about five weeks of gestation. So about our fifth week of embryonic development is when the heart is formed and it's already starting to contract and circulate blood and it contracts all the way up until the day we die. So it needs a lot of energy. The cardiac muscle uses primarily aerobic respiration, which means that it's using oxygen and it's going through Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain and making a lot of ATP. So the heart can always contract and it can intermittently use anaerobic respiration when you are doing high intensity exercise or you have a major stress response, but that's only for a short period of time. So aerobic respiration is the primary mode of making ATP. The heart 
primarily uses fatty acids to break down to make that energy. If you'll recall from our skeletal muscle video, slow twitch fibers that have more mitochondria that can contract for long periods of time without fatiguing, they primarily use fat for fuel. The cardiac muscle, like skeletal muscle, has striations. It has a striated pattern, a banding pattern, and that is because of the overlapping thick and thin filaments. So the sliding filament mechanism is the same way that the cardiac muscle contracts, just like the skeletal muscle. So we have the actin and the myosin and the troponin and the tropomyosin, and that whole mechanism is exactly the same in cardiac tissue. Now let's have a look at this diagram. There are one to three nuclei in each cell. They have a striated pattern, just like the skeletal muscle. So we have these light and dark regions because of the overlapping thick and thin filaments. The structure of the cardiac muscle cell is branched. And you can see in this micrograph, the branched pattern compared to a skeletal muscle cell where the fibers are all linear and parallel. This branched pattern gives the heart muscle strength. It makes it stronger. When the heart contracts, the top chambers, the atria, contract together, and then the ventricles, the bottom chambers, contract together. So this has to be a coordinated muscle contraction so that we can effectively pump blood through the chambers and then out to the lungs or to the body. In addition to the branching cells, we also have intercalated discs that help to increase the strength of the muscle fibers. If we zoom into an intercalated disc, so here we've had the connection point between one cell and another cell, and it has this overlapping pattern that holds it together very tightly. Now, also, there are these proteins, these adhering intercellular junction proteins called desmosomes, and they act a little bit like Velcro, and they hold the cells together very tightly. And actually, if you've ever overlapped the pages of two books together, that is like that overlapping folded portion of the intercalated discs. That makes the connection between those cells very strong. So here I have overlapped two books. So just multiple pages overlapping and then try to pull them apart. Do you think it's going to be easy? You... <laughs> okay, you have to try this at home. It makes it very strong. Now these heart muscle cells are held together so tightly because of that overlapping and also because of the desmosomes. Now the other feature of the intercalated disc is called the gap junctions. So these are channels. So if we have two cells side by side, and if you have gap junction channels, this is like little tunnels between these two cells, so signaling molecules can move in between those two cells very rapidly. We use gap junctions in the heart like an electrical synapse. So this moves ions in between cells very rapidly, which helps with the depolarization. So remember that muscles, in order for contraction to occur, there has to be an action potential. So the muscle cells have to depolarize. So in order to coordinate the muscle cells of the heart so that the atria contract together and the ventricles contract together, we need to be able to rapidly move ions in between cells. And then the depolarization can happen simultaneously so that all of those muscle fibers are coordinated. And some other features about our cardiac cells that we're gonna talk about in more detail in the next few videos. But about 1% of our cardiac cells are not contracting muscle cells. They are conducting cells. And these are important because the heart basically controls its own contraction. And we call this autorhythmicity. And this means that the heart has its own pace and we'll look at that in the next video. But basically the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system can 
increase or decrease the rate of contraction or the force of contraction. But left to its own devices, the heart will automatically depolarize and contract at its own rate. And then the last thing that's interesting about the heart is it makes a hormone. This hormone is called atrial natriuretic peptide. And this is released from atrial cells in response to changes in blood pressure. So when the blood pressure increases, and the blood pressure is too high, that is going to cause the atria to stretch, which will stimulate the release of atrial natriuretic peptide, which will overall decrease blood pressure. So the way it does this is it actually targets the kidneys. It will tell the kidneys to excrete sodium, which will pull water with it, which means we're gonna pee a little bit more. And when we have less blood volume, then we have lower blood pressure. There's other hormones that do the opposite, and we'll talk about that in another video. So that is an overview of our cardiovascular system, and here is a chart comparing cardiac muscle tissue with skeletal and smooth muscle tissue.